Welcome to this live video teleconference on human factors engineering and medical devices. I'm Mark Barnett, Communications Director in FDA Center for Devices and Radiological Health, and I'm going to be serving as your moderator this afternoon. Some of you may remember that one of our teleconferences several months ago dealt with minimizing medical errors. It was a timely topic back then, and it's a timely topic now because medical error is getting a lot of attention in the healthcare community, in the Congress, in the news media, in the FDA certainly, and, and among the manufacturers of medical products. As we all know, part of the reason for that increased attention was the report of the Institute of Medicine that estimated that medical error kills tens of thousands of people each year and in this country alone. What's important this afternoon is realizing that part of that toll is associated with medical devices. We can see that here in the FDA. If you look at recalls, uh, you find that almost half of them are the result of design deficiencies. And uh, if you look at the medical device reports that we get, about a third of those cite use errors. And many of those reports involve patient injury or death. It's not that these errors are being made by people who don't know what they're doing. I mean, errors can be made by fully competent health professionals. Sometimes that happens when the interface between the user and the device is confusing. Maybe the control panel is cluttered or a display is poorly marked or it's poorly lit or the instructions aren't clear. Sometimes that happens when the user is stressed out or tired or when the environment is noisy or there's a lot of distractions. You just think about the sounds and the stress levels in a busy emergency room. To prevent use errors, devices have to be designed with the user in mind right from the start, taking into account that person's abilities, limitations, the environment in which the device is likely to be used. Some people call that designing the user into the device, and of course another name for it is human factors engineering, which is the science that studies the interaction between people and equipment. And of course, that's the subject of this teleconference. Human factors engineering plays an important part in the strategic plan of FDA Center for Devices and Radiological Health. And so we asked the center director, Dr. David Feigl, to tell us a little bit more about that. Let's watch the video. As many of you know, our center has recently embarked on a strategic plan that's built around what we call the total product life cycle. What that means is that all of us, manufacturers, regulators, and users, must pay attention to the safety and effectiveness of a product throughout its existence, from the initial concept, to the development and testing, to marketing, its actual use, and all the way through to the obsolescence. This teleconference couldn't be timelier because its topic, human factors engineering, is a critical component in applying the total product life cycle concept to medical devices. Human factors engineering is a powerful tool to improve the safety of medical devices and reduce the potential for use errors. It means taking into account the abilities and limitations of the intended user when you're designing or modifying a device or as well as using human factor principles to understand and anticipate potential hazards. At the earliest stages of design, human factors means considering the ways in which a device is going to be used, the capabilities and limitations of the users, the environment in which the product will be used, and the possible problems that users might experience. Later, including human factors considerations in clinical trials, can enable you to demonstrate the safety and effectiveness of the device in the hands of intended users. Moving on through the total product life cycle, during the period of initial product release, it's very important for all of us to watch carefully for hazards that weren't anticipated. We know from experience that applying human factors early in the game significantly reduces surprises at this point. But of course, an unanticipated problems can always occur. And if that happens, collaboration between industry, the clinical community, and FDA can help to find and fix problems early. 
Human factors engineering is important after a product is marketed too. As problems arise, it's sometimes tempting to simply chalk them up to user error and forget them. But it's important to go beyond that and to be especially vigilant to use errors. That means investigating and documenting problems and identifying trends. And it's also important to be mindful of changes in the way that a product is used, such as new environment or different users. As you go about updating or modifying a product, it's important to consider new information on how the product is actually being used and the changing needs of users. Again, human factors is the key. And of course, we want you to remember how important it is to report use problems to the FDA. This is an essential step because it assures that we're able to do our part, which is to identify trends in the larger aggregate, and that in turn can help you in managing your product. Today, you'll be hearing from key individuals from FDA, as well as human factor experts from industry and the clinical community. We hope this discussion helps you use human factor engineering in managing your device throughout the total product life cycle. Thanks, and I, I hope you're going to enjoy this program. Okay, we're back live, and I want to tell you a little bit now about today's format. We're going to focus on two main areas using two separate panel sessions. The first one is going to be a panel of FDA people who are going to talk about this agency's current role in the area of human factors engineering. And that's going to include pre-market review, field inspections, and consultation and guidance services. The second panel is going to consist of outside experts from the industry and also from the field of human factors engineering. And they're going to discuss how human factors can be incorporated in the design and development process for medical devices. We'll also have some other interesting things to see during the panels. For example, a conversation with Dr. Statlin, the new director of the Office of Dice Evaluation. And there's a videotaped segment that we recently shot in a hospital showing the effect of human factor design in the real world of medical practice. And of course, as in the past, we're going to reserve plenty of time at the end of the show to take your questions and comments, either phoned or faxed or emailed. Now, those numbers should be appearing on your screen now, and they're going to reappear from time to time during the broadcast. You can start sending us those questions anytime, beginning right now, and as in the past, you don't have to identify yourself. If we get more questions that we have time to answer on the air, we're going to provide answers to them on our website sometime over the next few weeks. And by the way, this broadcast is also being shown on the Internet, and the Internet version is being archived on the web so you can go back later and, and review parts of it. The Internet address to do that is going to be shown on your screen, and we're going to leave it up long enough for you to jot it down. And now let me introduce our first panel, a group of three FDA representatives. All of them are from FDA Center for Devices and Radiological Health. Ron Kay is a human factor specialist with the Office of Health and Industry Programs. Bob Gatling is director of the program operations staff in the Office of Device Evaluation. And Kim Troutman is a medical device quality systems expert in the Office of Compliance. Ron, let's begin with you and clear up a little terminology because we hear about the term use safety and then we hear about use error. What's the difference? Sure. Okay, if a person uses a medical device uh, that's perfectly operational and they end up making an error or errors and those errors result in ineffective treatment or perhaps injuries and death, that's use error. And now you can devi design devices so that the likelihood of use error is minimized. And when that's done, that results in what we call use safety. Just in a very general way, scope out what it is that you have in mind, what, what, what uh, an individual or a company would have to consider in looking at human factors engineering. Okay. Um, on a very general level, uh, there's... A uh, three major areas mm -hmm. uh, that uh, well, we should be seeing something. We on should the be screen, seeing. Right? I'm looking for yeah, right. that on the screen. Okay. Uh, if we could get that graphic up there, uh, there we go. Okay, uh, there's three major human factors areas. Nothing like live TV, Ron. Yes. See, that's right. <laughs> go ahead. Baptism of fire. Okay, uh, the uh, the use environment, the device user, and the devices themselves. Uh, it's it's helpful to think about these things uh, separately, and of course you have to think of how they interact as well. The use environment, of course, is the 
the environment where the device is used. You can have operating rooms or, or any environment where uh, light levels, noise levels, uh, vibration, temperature, these types of things uh, apply. At the home, you have uh, situations where for home users, there can be inadvertent abusive devices bumping uh, and, and other problems uh, in the home. Humidity in the shower? Oh, sure. That's a good example, and that, and that has happened. Uh, but uh, also just uh, stress, scheduling and, and, and stress dealing with uh, patients that are, are having severe medical problems uh, can apply a lot of pressure to users. So the environment is very uh, important to consider. Um, next, of course, is the users, and of course, another centrally important component of all this, and, and the important thing there is that users vary in their ability, their hearing ability, their ability to see, to understand, uh, familiarity with medical procedures, uh, that type of thing, uh, their expectations about how devices will work based on their familiarity with other similar devices can be very important. Um, we also have to consider their experience with a given device or the training that they've had. And so you can have uh, users that start out with a relatively low level become better after a, a time, perhaps. But it's important to realistically estimate what the capabilities of the user population are going to be uh, when you think about these things. Then, of course, there's the device itself. And for human factors, we're interested in what we call the device user interface. And that's all the components of the device with which users interact, what they touch, see, feel, hear, and so on. Uh, and so you can see how these three areas of consideration on the diagram, they come together when a device is actually used in the real world. And the result is going to be either safe and effective uh, results, of, uh, which is what we hope for, or unsafe and ineffective results, uh, or use error. Okay, thanks. I, I, before we go on with this conversation, I want to show a videotape, because I think it's going to apply to what we talk about next. Before we go on, and, uh, and, and talk to Bob Gatling about the pre-market review aspects of human factors engineering. I had a conversation recently with Dr. Bernard Statland, who's the new director of FDA's uh, Office of Valuation in the Center for Devices and Radiological Health. And I asked him how he viewed human factors engineering and the role that it plays in evaluating new devices. And while we were at it, Dr. Statlin and I also talked in general about how he views his new job and what he sees in the future. So let's watch. Dr. Statlin, we're going to make you do double duty this morning because I want to talk to you first about your new job and how you view it and, and uh, your view of the future and also then talk to you about human factors and how that affects the product review process. So let's, let's get into your, how long, you've been here about seven months, is that That's right? That's right, seven months. Enough to accumulate maybe 6,000 emails? Emails and meetings are really Emails the highlights meetings, of my right. job. It's the name of the game. Why don't you start out talking a little bit about your background, because I think that the audience might be interested in that. Well, in about three or four sentences, I'm a native of Minnesota. I have both an MD and a PhD, and I'm a board-certified clinical pathologist. In many ways, I think I've covered the four sides of the square. The first side, academics, where I was a professor and a researcher. The second side, the hospital side. The third side, industry, and I think that's very important uh, in what I do now. I've been a CEO and president of a large commercial laboratory and a consultant for various companies, and now I've come full circle to mix metaphors, the square and the circle, now working with the government. Both sides of the street, in other words. That's very interesting. Uh, how would you characterize the relationship between, between your office and the industry? Uh, do you think it's what it should be? Do you think it needs to be changed? I think it's getting better. As I understand it, in years past, the relationship has really gone on one side of the spectrum to, from an adversarial relationship to one of collaboration. And I think today we're much closer to the collaborative model. However, I do think that we always can improve upon our interaction with industry. You know, the fact that I'm not going to ask you today about backlogs, I think, is indicative in itself because those really do seem to be a thing of the past, and we're all thankful for that, and I'm sure you agree. But beyond that... There are other ways, perhaps, that the, we still in the FDA can use some improvement in our relations with industry and our performance. Do you think that's true, and what would they be? Well, I think we can improve that relationship. I think the first thing is truly communication. It's very important that the FDA communicates with industry as to what we need and the application process in terms of what the new technologies will be and what our expectations are. 
On the same hand, I think it's very important for industry to communicate with us, uh, continue to have a high level of integrity, let us know when adverse events occur so we are not blindsided. And that's really the basis of a very positive interaction. You, you said at some time uh, several weeks ago that you believed there were, there were four F's. And I sort, of, I sort of grooved on that. Do you remember what they were? Well, I certainly do. There may even be five Fs. But the first F is one of uh, friendliness. I'm sure our audience, this is, a, <laughs> this is a family show, but so be careful. Go ahead. Uh, the first F is friendliness. And I think that's very critical. Um, I've instructed the staff to answer phones promptly, to uh, be friendly with the individuals, and to have an open policy. I think the second F that is important is fairness to treat all comers equally. All petitioners have the same opportunity of um, getting our ear and to approach things in a very rational way. Obviously, the third F, fast, is critical. It's very important to get the Im information in and out in a very efficient manner. Companies have a burn rate, and the longer they wait for um, an assessment of their submission, the worse it is for them. Uh, the fourth F uh, is really one of follow-through. And I think it's very important that not only for us to be involved in pre-market, but also to work with the other offices as a product uh, is in use and clinical use to be certain that it works. And the last F I would add is firm. Once we've made a decision, once we've asked for something, to continue that same policy so that there's predictability. So if we follow the Fs of fairness, of friendliness, of firm, of fast and follow through, I think we'll be doing a good share of our job and the interaction with industry will be a very positive one. Let me turn the question around and ask you to look at the industry. How can they improve? What would you like to see them do in terms of improvement and, and performance? Well, I think industry can do many things. I think, first of all, in the quality of their submissions. Remembering that the, a reviewer is just a person looking at uh, a submission in the same way that your English teacher looked at the themes you wrote. If it's uh, well put together, if it's typed, if it's uh, done well, you'll probably get a higher grade. Well, I think it's very critical for the industry to um, submit applications that are easy to read, that are well organized. I think second is to be forthright, to present all the information um, as soon as it's available. And as I said earlier, when problems come up, to let us know about it. And last but not least, it's very important for us to have the technical expertise ready to evaluate new applications. So if there's a new emerging technology, such as genetic testing or stents in neurology, we need the geneticists, we need the neurologists on board to be ready. This way, um, we can work together. Putting it very simply, we need each other very much. It's a very strong interrelationship. You know, you just talked about new technology, and I think that should be a concern. If you look down to the future, th these technologies are bursting out like mushrooms. That's probably going to accelerate. How are you going to keep up? And I mean not just with respect to resources, in terms of people and money, but expertise as these new fields burgeon. Well, that's a superb question. In many ways, it's probably the most important question. Close to 90% of our budget is spent on people. We're as good as our people. It's been estimated in the next five to ten years, and I'm sure you're aware of that, there'll be almost a complete turnover, at least of 50 percent of the people working for the government. So we have the graying of the uh, personnel. As new people um, are needed to replace the people who are leaving, it's very important to get the right people on board. Having been in all other areas of uh, medicine, I realize how exciting this job is, and part of my responsibilities to share with others that this is one of the best chances for uh, people who are in industry today, who are in academics today, etc. So it's really done in the following way. One, we have to see what our needs are. Second, in this Magnet for Excellence program that Dr. Feigl has talked about, to make our workplace an inviting one and always to keep ahead of the curve. Um, there's a famous saying that we quote in our circles that I guess is Wayne Goretzky, the hockey player, Skate to where the puck will be, and that's a secret. Well, we have to skate to where the technology will be. We need the people with the expertise, not for today, but for tomorrow. What's your greatest concern as you look to the future? My greatest concern is that in our urge to get submissions through quickly, that we don't have a product that will have deleterious effects on individuals, or conversely, and our need 
to be 100% safe, we don't delay products. Every day is a King Solomon-like decision to kill the baby or not, to let the submissions be approved or not, and to figure out how to weigh the pros and cons are the biggest ones. So not only I, but many people in our group have some sleepless nights as we try to make those uh, decisions. Um, sleepless nights aside, do you have cause for optimism? You see I'm counts? very optimistic. I think we're doing a very good job. I think the numbers demonstrate that. The quality of people is excellent. You know, I've said to many of the folks who I've known over the years, that, and I truly mean it, I've never found a more committed group of individuals more competent than the people that work with me. And uh, my job is to keep up with them and give them an image of where we want to go in the future. Thanks. Let's, let's turn now to, to the uh, subject of human factors and how that affects the product approval process. Where does human factors fit in with the total product life cycle that we're talking about all the time and with your, your program of product approval? Oh, I think it's critical. Um, you, can't look at pro you cannot look at a product by itself. How is an individual going to use that product? Um, is it easy uh, for the individual to understand the instructions? Is it um, user-friendly to turn the various knobs and all the rest? And all the things we do in the Office of Device Evaluation relate to evaluating studies, evaluating what the companies have demonstrated in the field. And I cannot think of one device that doesn't deal with the human being interacting with it. So human factors are critical in what we're doing. What, do, what are your staff looking for with human factors, just in a general way, when they, when I think they evaluate a job, device? I think our staff is really looking at two things. One, in the design of the device, did the company take human factors into account? And second, in their presentation to us, did they underscore that they looked at this in preparation. And, and that's really what it all, what it's really comes down to. Did they take it into account and they have they told us about this in their submission? Are you considering, I mean, by you I mean the, the office, considering human factors more now, let's say, than you did five years ago? What? We are. Uh, you probably are familiar that in 1999 there was a very controversial but probably very correct report that the Institute of Medicine came out with and they talked about errors and mistakes that healthcare workers have made and are making in this country. And tens of thousands of individuals may have died from some of these errors. Most oftentimes, there are prescriptions that are written illegibly, prescriptions that are not um, filled correctly, or just errors in judgment. And as a consequence, you, one can have the best machine, the best instrument, the best drug. But if the interaction is such that errors occur, the patient will suffer. So we're very cognizant of that. We always ask the questions, the design of the device, the training of the user, the ease of use, and the possibility of human error. And all these things are taken into account as we evaluate the safety and effectiveness of the devices. Dr. Satlin, thanks very much. This was a real pleasure. Thank you, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Okay. Okay, we're back live, and Bob, you, you heard your boss talk about the increased emphasis and interest in, in human factors. How does that translate to what goes on on the ground? I mean, what, are, what is ODE looking for? Well, what Dr. Stallin said is absolutely correct. We're much more sensitive to how we look at the user and the use environment for products when we're reviewing the safety and effectiveness of those particular products. Well, get specific. What about for 510Ks? Have you actually changed the criteria that the reviewers use when they go... Go through a 510K? No. For the regulatory criteria of getting a product to the market, it's still whether the product is as safe and effective as those products that are already out there on the market. And as you know, the 510K process is how most products get to the market. And last year, I think we had over 4,000 that went to the uh, market that particular way. And we're still looking at the comparative of this new product that wants to go on the market to those products that are already out there and can be linked back to those that were on the market before 1976. So how would you expect a manufacturer, say, to go about determining the adequacy of human factors engineering, say with a 510K product, well, I'm this hoping, comparison. Right. I'm hoping what they're going to be doing is, is in their early developmental stage, they're using those design controls and they're considering human factors when they're really getting into the initial stages of that 
device development. And if they've done that, then they're going to have an easier time getting through the regulatory process because the product's going to work and work correctly. And also, when they get to the market, they're going to have a better product also. I'm talking about things like doing mock-up simulations. Sure, those so are ex excellent ways to do that. They can go out and actually talk to the users out there who use those similar types of products and gather good information and feed that back into their own development process. Uh, Ron talked about environment and it talked about the user. It seems to me that if you have a 510k product that has been traditionally used, let's say in a hospital setting or, or by healthcare professionals, mm -hmm. and then you have a shift in which it's now going over the counter, maybe used at home, I would think that would be, you think about environment and users changing, that would be a signal, uh-oh, we better look at human factors. Is that, was that the case? You're absolutely correct. When we, when we get a device and they say they want to go into the home, even though it may be prescription, but it's going to be used in the home environment, or it's going to go over the counter. We're certainly much more sensitive into the labeling, the information that may be passed back to the user of that through the training by the physician or the healthcare pr professional. What about with PMAs? Anything special there or any changes that you foresee? Well, we've been doing PMAs about the same all along. In a PMA, we're, we're absolutely looking at the effect, safety and effectiveness of that device when it's used. It's not, we're not comparing it to another product on the market, although there may be a control group. And in that, they need to show how their development in the early stages and getting to clinical trials led to a safe use of that particular product that everybody can use it correctly, know how to use it, and that will result in less adverse events occurring. You know, that, when you talk about clinical trials, though, you're talking about a well-trained, well-motivated clinical investigator. You're talking about a very circumscribed group of patients with a particular disease state. Absolutely. Then all of a sudden this thing goes out and it's used by physicians right. who are not as well-qualified. The number of patients goes way up. That's a concern, I would think. Absolutely, and when we see a lot of PMAs, there may be only like five um, uh, investigational sites and only maybe five or ten uh, physicians who have actually used the product. And our concern is that while they're very good at that and they've learned how to use that, when you move it out to the more general community of the physicians who are going to be using it, how is that product going to uh, work? in their hands. And there may be some additional training courses that they need to provide, or we may actually require a post-approval study to evaluate how that product ends up out there in those first 10 or 20 sites. As if you, if you don't, most products do not require post-approval studies, so most of them go out there and they're used. And the question then gets to be what Dr. Feigl talked about, I think, in the tape, and that is somehow getting the information right. that you accumulate in the real world about how that product's being used somehow fed back into the pre-market process. Is that, is that valid? That's right. Absolutely. What we want to be able to do is get that information back. We'll be looking at uh, the adverse events reports, some MDR reports that are coming into us, and our reviewers should be looking at, at that and trying to feed that back in. If they see a situation that they've already seen out in the real world and this new product has the same design characteristic, we're going to ask questions about that. What about the phenomenon that's sometimes called technology creep? I mean, you've got a class two device, common device, and over a period of time, the manufacturer keeps tweaking it. The model changes sure. somewhat, and the next year it changes again, it changes again. That must be of tremendous concern to you, because if they don't use human factors right. every time they make those changes, you've got a real problem. How do you keep track of that? Well, it is hard to keep track of that, and we're really concerned about that, because products maybe have started on the market in the 1980s, and they've made new changes, new technologies, new features and stuff have been added. We're just hoping that as part of their design controls for these new features, that they continue to bring in those human factors things in their development, and that they've looked at the whole product, not just the change they're going to make. Let's get back to the, to the PMA situation and talk specifically about how does it look in the submission? What do you want to see? in terms of human factors. Sure, as Dr. Stalin said, we're expecting that the submission or the, the sponsor to include in that submission information in a summary form or more details about how they considered human factors and their development of the process. And that goes all the way back to the before they started the clinical trials. And they may have made and found changes that were required as a result of the clinical trials and have made those changes in the newer models and we want to be able to see that. Now if they went through a clinical trial and they discovered a problem and they changed it successfully. Do you want to see a record of the problem and how it was changed? Because after all, you end up with a good product anyway. You, you still want to see that progress? Absolutely. When we're, especially for PMA products, we've seen where in the clinical trial they made one or two changes, or they may have come to a point where, ooh, we need to really make this big change, and they'll make these. And then 
when they send in the application, we want to be able to see they got to that point, they made it, there was something going on, they made the change, and then they, the change fixed it. So documentation is, is really important then? It is absolutely critical and we want to see that. Have you seen situations in your experience where, as a matter of fact, using human factors is, and, and your involvement in it has made the product better? Sure, there was a, I think it was a monitor many years ago and it came in and it, was, it had an alarm situation that it would uh, highlight and it had a little tiny screen and what it did was it had a code for the alarm of what was going on. Well, unless you knew what the code was, you wouldn't know what to do to fix the particular problem. So we talked to the manufacturer about it and they ended up putting a little placard on there that, that uh, decoded those codes. The other thing was it had a, an alarm, an audible alarm that went off. But because of the use environment, which is in the um, uh, operating room, they found that all these alarms going off, it'd be best if it just went silent after a while till they could get around to fix it. But they didn't have any other way to notify somebody that the alarm situation was still there. So they finally just put a light on. with my alarm clock right, in the morning. Right. It doesn't come back on again. Right, so they left it with a light so that the light would stay on. They let uh, people know that there was still an alarm situation with that device. Kim, let's start talking about the quality system regulation and how that applies to, to human factors. One of the things it says in the regulation is that you have to determine the needs of the user. I mean, how do you do that? <laughs> what does it mean, needs well, of the user? The needs of the users can be just what these gentlemen have been talking about. Um, there is in the requirement for design validation the fact that you are actually validating against the user needs or intended uses. Um, in the regulation, human factors gets played into in several different areas. First of all, we have the design inputs up front. When we go into looking at what the design of a product encompasses, it's often people going out asking doctors, and asking people, well, what do you want this device to be? What do you want it to, to do? So someone then has to take those inputs and put it into engineering specifications. In doing that, it's very important to understand in a hospital environment or any other environment that it may be used, what are some of the norms, what are some of the standards that, that are expected? Um, there's certain color codes in the hospital that, right. that mean particular things. Um, there's certain ways that people are used to doing things. Um, it's very important that right up front in that design input, some of these human factors are, are considered. So when you start changing or start refining, if you will, these <coughs> requirements into specifications. Then you've got an engineering task of verifying, okay, here's my input. I want this to weigh that much. I verify it, and yes, this device weighs that much. But when we get into design validation, that goes back to, well, have we really met the user needs and the intended uses? And they were talking about challenging the design, right? Right. Under, under simulated use conditions? Right. And simulated use conditions can be great. Um, in the regulation, it talks about either actual or simulated use use conditions. Design validation requires what we call clinical evaluation and that's a broader term than you'll see in, in ODE. Clinical evaluation can include clinical trials but goes into some of the things that Ron was saying. Looking at the history of, of devices, especially for class 2 devices, what kind of predicate devices were there? What kind of problems have there been? Uh, what other things do I need to consider? For example, a defibrillator. If you've got a portable defibrillator, that defibrillator can be used in the hospital. It could be used by an EMT in an ambulance, and nowadays it can be used by a fireman or a policeman, or they even want to put them in stadiums and so forth. So if you looked at a simulated use condition, you can't just pick one of those environments. You can't pick the hospital, which would probably be your best case scenario, the most highly trained and, and sophisticated people using, using that device. You need to look at the range. And it's also not fair just to pick the other extreme, to pick to pick maybe the, the uneducated as far as EMT skills from a, a layperson's point of view because there are other situations in, in, in the hospital that you may need to consider. So in whether you use actual or simulated use conditions, you have to make sure you consider all the user needs and intended uses. And don't just you know, be careful not to pick, pick one and narrow it down to one. When the FDA goes in and inspects a manufacturer, where do they expect to see all this documentation you're talking about? When the inspector goes in, the first place they're going to look is the design history file. And when we talk about design input or design validation, you're not going to necessarily have one little neat file that says, okay, human factors, boop, there it is. Human factors considerations are going to happen throughout the life cycle of the design. Um, I think the design input is a very key 
one. I mean, if they don't consider it up front, some of the things that Bob was saying, when you get into clinical trials, you start seeing those things manifest. And now you've got a lot of money invested, a lot of time invested, you've got patients invested <coughs> into this. So if they can eliminate some of those those potential errors early up front in the early design phases, that's optimal. But like I think Dr. Statlin said, you can never you can never guess everything. So hopefully you do. You do run your, your clinical evaluations or your, your studies throughout the design to make sure you try to get the broadest. Now the other place that you're going to see some of human factors influence is in the corrective and preventive action system. Um, a couple people have talked about that here already. We see a lot of that in the field. The field really is going to see human factors in, in both the design as well as the corrective preventive action, where the manufacturer basically is hearing of information um, that something's not going right. And it is very easy for the manufacturers just to chalk it up and say, oh, they're not using my device right. But the quality system... Use error. That's right. That's exactly what they call it. Oh, the, it's the doctor's fault. They didn't do it like we told them to in the labeling. But there's a requirement both in the quality system regulation as well as in our labeling regulation that says if the manufacturers become aware of the device being misused or used off-label, they have a responsibility to take appropriate corrective actions, whether that be additional labeling, whether it be additional training, whether it be safety notifications. And so we will also, when we go and investigate, see human factors coming forward, if you will, in the corrective and preventive action. And you have to be real careful. Fixing something that appears to correct one thing may induce a problem somewhere else. For example, um, we had a, a manufacturer who had some heating. It was a home use device and the, the unit was overheating. It reminded me of your humidity in the shower ex <laughs> example. And so they did something to open up the vents of the back of the machine so that there'd be more airflow. Well, what was happening is the, the company was getting complaints, if you will, of toys and pennies being put in the back. The vents were big enough now, it's in a home use, that there's children that, they, that they were around. They thought it was a wishing well. They, they were sticking <laughs> pennies and toys, and so they, they fixed the air of, or they fixed the problem yeah. of having good flow or, or air ventilation, but at the same time, they opened the vents up, and in a home situation, it was just an inviting toy, you know, put something in a slot, so. You, you talked about the, the responsibility of the manufacturers and so on, but what if they don't fulfill those responsibilities? I mean, what action does the FDA take specifically when, in fact, human factors are not adequately considered? Well, the first place the investigators are going to look um, is in the design and the, and the corrective preventive action. Um, they will show up on a 43, an FDA 43, which is the list of observations that the inspector issues at the end of an inspection. And often those take the manifestation of inadequate procedures to consider human factors or inadequate procedures to consider the user needs and intended use, whether that be at the design input stage, whether that be in the evaluation of the uh, particular design validation. Um, also, they can. we often see this in the corrective and preventive action system. We have an example where a company was out trying to basically compete with another major competitor. The device had a cinching mechanism, which the first person on the market used in a, in a clockwise direction, so that it was cinched in a clockwise direction. For whatever reason, the, the person trying to introduce the new device put the cinching mechanism so that you would do it in a counterclockwise situation. What happened is when the doctors in the controlled clinical trial got there, they were very educated, they were very attuned to the labeling, they were told to do it in a counterclockwise direction, so that's what they did. However, when the device went to more general purpose use throughout, um, they were finding that doctors all over the place were doing it in the clockwise position for two reasons. Number one, the competitor's device, which had already been out there, did that, so they were used to doing it. And second, it was the old adage, lefty loosey, righty tighty. I mean, and, and so these are simple things that you would think from a human factors perspective should have been considered, been considered prior to that, that being marketed. I got some good news in my ear here. And they're telling <laughs> me that, that questions are piling up. We've got a lot of people out there, and I'm delighted that you're doing that. Keep those questions coming in, and we are going to have time at the end to do that. But that means that we have to keep our comments here fairly brief so that we do have enough time at the end. Okay? Uh, let me go back, um, uh, Ron, and, and, and talk to you a little bit about what you guys do. Because Kim and Bob have been talking essentially about a regulatory function on the part of the FDA, pre-market and essentially post-market. But what you do in your field in the FDA really is not as much regulatory as it is consultative. You work with the rest of the center 
How do you do that? Yes. Okay, briefly. we do that uh, in several ways, and I'll, I'll try to keep this brief. Uh, one thing we do is provide training to the center. In fact, we've got training coming up next week on the 26th. Uh, but we also uh, work with the Office of Device Evaluation, Bob's group. Uh, we look at pre-market um, uh, submissions of new devices, and uh, particularly where uh, use issues are thought to be important and of concern. Uh, we work with Kim's group, the Office of compliance uh, and and I've had some experience in uh, working with health hazard evaluations where devices that are out in the field are running into problems there's injuries deaths that sort of thing and we determine the nature of that uh, whether we can uh, what, what should be done about it uh, on occasion we can work with the manufacturer to fix those but that's not always the case um, we work with uh, the field inspection team. Uh, as do you go out and do inspections with them? Yes, occasionally. We don't do a lot of that, but we are doing more of that. And uh, we look at what is uh, how human factors is represented in the design, uh, device design history file. Uh, it, you know, basically, if it's been done adequately, uh, we look at device inputs and outputs and all that, all that stuff. We also look at the corrective and preventative action programs or the CAPA programs to see whether uh, complaints to the manufacturer about their devices have been handled uh, adequately, particularly from a use uh, perspective. And simultaneously, while we're on those inspections doing that, we are we are training the ins uh, the field inspectors themselves, who often don't have. Uh, a real good understanding of human factors or how to look for it or how to apply it in that way. That's what you do for the center, but now yes. beyond that and what's probably more interesting to this audience is that you actually provide some help to the industry too. You had some recent written guidance in fact, right? Yes, uh, we've we've uh, actually written several guidances and uh, we're going to post the, the names of those up on the screen at the break. Uh, the most recent one, uh, Medical Device Use Safety Incorporating Human Factors Engineering into Risk Management Management. That's the title. Uh, that's the title, yes. <laughs> and I finally memorized it. Um, and that came out in June of last year. And it provides uh, general guidance on understanding use error uh, and methodologies for applying human factors. Uh, and it also represents uh, some degree of philosophical shift by both the agency uh, and the medical device manufacturers in that uh, it, it describes how hazards uh, or potential hazards due to the use of a device uh, should be included in the risk analysis process as, it, as any other hazard would. That it, this uh, use is another type of potential hazard. Uh, not only that, but it goes beyond that and, and says uh, as far as the, the strategies for mitigation for hazards that are identified, uh, you know, it, it's not always uh, helpful just to state that one exists, but that when one does is stated for a given use related hazard th it should be demonstrated that that uh, mitigation tr uh, strategy is effective it, it gives and some general advice if you would for if I'm a company that I haven't been doing human factor very much what advice would you have in a general way based on your experience well, uh, it it's, uh, makes very good sense for a, a company to uh, get into human factors and to have a human factors capability uh, either in-house or uh, being able to, being acquainted with a consultant uh, that can do that for them. You've made the statement several <coughs> times that it's not as difficult as it seems. What do you mean by that? Well, a lot of people are afraid of human factors because it, it seems uh, it, it's kind of a, an odd thing for, for people to swallow. Uh, and, and companies, uh, people have, have talked to me confidentially and said that, well, they're a little reluctant or their management is a re little reluctant to get into human factors because they think any time they have to do that or if they do some sort of human factors analysis that they have to do an elaborate experiment and they have to have a large end size and they have to well, have a lot of People are used to time. clinical trials where you yes. do have to have big numbers, big end numbers, statistical right. significance, and what you're saying here is that that may That's not true. be the case always in this. Right. Human factors can be incorporated into clinical trials with 
the big incisors, and that's fine. Um, but uh, when you're doing applying human factors upstream in the design process, uh, those types of analyses don't necessarily have to have large ends. You don't have to get into parametric statistics. You know, just a little bit of descriptive statistics uh, is fine. But you can learn a lot of information that way. Now, in addition to giving written guidance, you will actually consult with and help companies directly. Is that right? Uh, so that's true. Uh, yes, we do that, and we we encourage uh, manufacturers to call us to get in contact with us. Uh, I believe we're going to have our phone number and email on the screen at some. We're going point. to have. Here we go. We're going to have your. We're going to have <laughs> my home number. Yes, your home <laughs> number on there, and you will you will do twenty four seven service for people. Exactly. Right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Right. And Mark, uh, Ron's just group, kidding. Guy. Ron's group does a lot of international standards work too, right? Ron? That's yeah. correct. Yeah, we participate on both national and international um, standard setting committees uh, with respect to human factor standards. Before we close this panel, I want you to see a videotape and then maybe comment on it. Uh, Dr. Matt Weinger is, is professor of anesthesiology at the University of California San Diego School of Medicine. And he's also a staff physician at the San Diego VA Medical Center. Dr. Weinger has a special interest in human factors engineering as it applies to patient safety in a hospital environment. And so we asked him to talk about the relationship between the design of the device, the clinical user, and the safety of the patient. And Dr. Weinger agreed to be interviewed in his hospital and to show us how human factors engineering affects the safety of some of the devices that are used in surgery. Let's watch. In the clinical environment, one must consider three critical factors with regard to usability. The first is that devices uh, are going to be used by a wide range of users, and that diversity of users includes not just differences in training and experience, but a variety of other factors such as sleep deprivation, distractions, workload. The second issue is that there's a wide range of use environments for a single device, from a patient using the device at home to clinicians using the device in a complex operating room procedure. The final factor is, will the device's user interface effectively support what the clinician needs to do at the time they need to do it? The operating room is a good place to see some of these usability issues in action. This is uh, called a pressure relief valve. Uh, it's used to uh, vent excess gas in the system. When it's closed, um, the gas stays in the system. When it's open, it's vented. There have been a number of situations uh, where this valve was closed without the clinician appreciating it, and the excess pressure in the system caused trauma to the patient's lungs. The anesthesia machines uh, have been designed with a number of uh, safety features to prevent use error. For example, unintentional uh, um, movement of the knobs that control the gas flow is protected by this bar. The different knobs have different shapes to help someone identify uh, oxygen from air. In addition, one cannot turn the oxygen completely off. There's always some residual oxygen to deliver to the patient. Uh, on some machines, you cannot deliver too much nitrous oxide uh, without the oxygen rising to match it. And one can see here that the, an alarm is going off from the excess of uh, nitrous oxide. This device uh, has a variety of um, usability issues related to the fact that it's so complex. Um, there are so many different ways that one can uh, manipulate the controls in order to modify the display. It's uh, a full keyboard uh, as well as a variety of other knobs and, and controls. Uh, and uh, it uh, can be very time consuming in the operating room to use. Uh, when the clinician has many other clinical responsibilities. This, this is actually an example of a very well-designed device in that it's intuitive that if you squeeze the bag, you're delivering positive pressure, in this case oxygen, to the patient. Um, it's called an intuitive mapping, which uh, is in contrast to many other types of uh, device design where the relationship between the user action and the device's response is not intuitive and sometimes it's counterintuitive. When a device is designed in isolation, 
where the user's needs and requirements haven't been adequately considered, that device is potentially unsafe. Usability affects safety, and if I can't use a device uh, in a crisis situation effectively, then I'm not able to respond to the patient's needs. There have been a number of situations where drugs have been administered in the intravenous line but never got to the patient because the stopcock was in the wrong orientation or they injected into the wrong IV tubing and didn't have it running. Um, the use of the devices, um, the manufacturer often considers it for a specific uh, indication, but once it's out there in the in the world, it off, the indications often expand so that the user population and environment of a device's use typically expands significantly after it's released. One of the, the most important problems we have in, in the operating room is delivering sterile supplies to the field and therefore its packaging becomes a very significant problem when the design is such that we have difficulty opening the, the product. Uh, in a sterile fashion. One of the problems um, is a packaging like this where you have to pull it open like this and then you're supposed to drop it onto the sterile table like this. This is very substandard. It makes it very difficult to dispense the item onto the table without contaminating it. Or this one. There is no method of opening it at all that will allow for a sterile delivery. Product labeling remains a problem. Many drugs are packaged in ways that makes it difficult to distinguish them from each other. For example, here are two drugs with blue tops that are very different drugs, uh, yet appear somewhat similar, and uh, the labels are very small, so in a, in a hurry, a uh, drug that's put in the wrong place could be grabbed and given uh, to the patient, and this happens very frequently. Intravenous infusion pumps uh, raise a number of usability issues here in this patient after heart surgery. It's on 10 different infusions through six different pumps. Uh, figuring out which drug is being administered to uh, through which infusion pump uh, can be difficult. In, a, in addition to issues with regard to patient safety, these heavy pumps on the tall IV poles can tip over and injure care providers. When a device's user interface design is flawed, it can promote use error. In addition, users may have problem recovering from errors. And finally, in a crisis or unusual situation, uh, the device's use may in fact make the situation worse. A real problem in the operating room is the large number of cables and wires that are not only a tripping hazard, it's not uncommon to forget to plug something in and the battery runs out or uh, to uh, plug in the wrong thing to attach to the wrong device to um, the wrong cable. Uh, and these are obviously uh, uh, clear usability issues. The position of devices uh, in the clinical work environment can result in uh, problems, in, uh, particularly with monitoring. In this case, an electronic record keeping system located optimally for use, it blocks the uh, vision of the clinician of a number of the other essential monitors and can often be in the way when the clinician is trying to uh, interact with those other devices. One of the issues you can see very clearly here is they're, they're managing the patient's airway, but they're having to turn, um, you know, 120 degrees behind them to see the monitors. Many hospitals are trying to go to 100% uh, electronic or computerized record. However, there are a number of usability problems, and it's much more difficult in a computer to enter data that's very easy to do by hand. The increased emphasis on electronic record keeping has required uh, clinicians to learn how to type or uh, to type more effectively in order to enter the data uh, rapidly without distraction from other clinical tasks. Effective device design will allow a clinician to use a device correctly the very first time without the need for training or referring to manuals. Clinicians will, however, become 
more effective at using the device with additional training or experience. One of the issues with surgical devices is that uh, many of them uh, are designed in a way that it's more difficult for the surgeon to do what they want to do because of awkward hand positions, awkward body positions, and this can sometimes be frustrating and even affect the quality of the surgical repair. An effective design will incorporate users in the design process from the very beginning and will consider carefully how a device will be used in the wide range of environments that it might be used in and the different types of users. There is a tremendous body of knowledge about human factors, usability, and interface design outside the medical domain. And I would encourage both industry and the government to draw on that expertise in their efforts to make medical devices more usable. I want to ask our panelists now for just a quick reaction to, to that tape. Ron, before I ask you, though, I have to say that what amazed me is watching that thing was the comment of the nurse that she couldn't get the product out of the bag without violating sterility, which would seem to be so simple. It's uh, remarkable. Impo impossible not to commit a use error in right. that case. What, what did you think in general about the, about the video? I, I thought the video was great. Uh, that example uh, and others, uh, very good insight uh, and, and a window on human factors in, in the hospital operating room. Uh, one thing we need to remember is that th that environment is a subset of all the environments, and those devices are a subset of all the devices. Um, you also have different specialty areas in the hospital, of course. Um, you have doctors doctor's offices and of course as I've said nursing homes and and the home users and different devices uh, throughout uh, so we have to remember that this is a snapshot of a larger spectrum of device use and use environments Kim from a compliance standpoint you saw <clears throat> the tube lines that were hanging down right. one time a manufacturer came in and as a proposed fix to a user error as they called it because the doctors and nurses were clamping the line they wanted to put a label on each, uh, one of the lines and say do not clamp what do you think the probability of those nurses and doctors with all those lines, A, seeing it with all those intravenous lines hanging down, and then following the directions? So when compliance sees these type of corrective actions and, and say, no, this isn't going to work, and the company doesn't understand, well, why not? Um, this is a good example as to why it would not work in the actual user setting. Bob? Well, I thought it was a great educational uh, video because it, when you're looking in the operating room, you see all these different devices up and around and all these uh, um, users that are trying to interact with them. Yet when we actually evaluate devices, we're only looking at that device one at a time. One at a time. And so that, I think that was real educational for me to own that one. Thanks. Thanks for a very good discussion. It's time now to take a 10-minute break. And during that break, you're going to see on your screen some important addresses and phone numbers and websites where you can get more information about human factors and engineering and how it affects medical devices. And we're also going to include some information on how to purchase a tape of this program. Also, we're going to give you a website where you can get a schedule of upcoming teleconferences from our FDA studio. So you may want to jot all that information down. Anyway, we'll see you back here in 10 minutes.
Okay, we're back live and ready to introduce our second panel. And this time we're going to be talking to non-FDA folks who are experts in various non-regulatory aspects of human factors. We're going to cover how human factors can be incorporated into the design and development of medical devices. Some of these panelists are employed by device manufacturers or consulting firms, but today they're not representing those organizations. They're here simply as individual experts in this field. When we finish this panel, we're going to call back all the panelists and answer your phone and fax and emailed questions. Our first panelist is Dr. Pamela Jamar, a technical fellow and senior human factors scientist at Medtronic in Minneapolis. She has over 20 years of experience in designing interfaces between humans and computers for medical, commercial, space, and defense systems. At Medtronic, she's led the introduction of human factors engineering into product development, and her current work is focused on the instruments that physicians and patients use to interact with pacemakers and defibrillators. Dr. John Senders is a consultant in human factors and human error, and he teaches intellectual property law and cognitive science at the law school of York University in Toronto. He's worked in the field of human factors since 1950 at the U.S. Air Force Aero, Aero Medical Laboratory at Bolt, Berenick and Newman at the University of Toronto and at the University of Maine. <coughs> Timothy Badaki is a consultant with Hazard Management Associates. He's worked with corporate clients who manufacture pharmaceuticals and medical devices, advising them on product safety programs, loss and liability prevention, and risk management. He also trains staff in these areas, and he's been an expert witness in legal cases involving human factors, warnings, and usability engineering. Michael Wickland is vice president and director of the New England Research Center of the American Institutes for Research, where he consults with medical device manufacturers on a wide range of design and evaluation issues. He's one of the lead authors of the Human Factors Engineering Process Guide under development by the Association for the Advancement of Medical Instrumentation. He's also an adjunct associate professor in the Human Factors Program at Tufts University. Dr. Mark Brecht is founder of Brecon Consulting and a senior partner at Human Factors Plus, where he consults on usability and interface design. As a specialist in human behavior, Mark works with designers, engineers, and systems managers to ensure that products and services are compatible with the needs and capabilities of the people who use them. He's recently helped clients set up programs to incorporate human factors, education, design, and testing into their product development cycle. And with that introduction, Mark, let me start with you. And, and let's say that uh, I'm uh, in a man device manufacturing firm. I've not done human factors things before very much. How do I get started in terms of people, facilities, and so on? Well, I think one of the important things to do is to consider how you're going to acquire those resources that you'll be needing. And those resources will vary depending on the stage of development of the product that you're working on, the types of products you're doing, and everything else. Um, obviously, for a company that's never had it before, their, intent, their purpose and, and need is to really get an internal advocate, somebody that's going to be supportive of what needs to be done and can push that through at all levels from engineering to management. In my work, I've often worked very closely with industrial engineers and industrial designers. Those are the people that typically recognize the need for human factors to support their design work, for instance, but may not have either the, the mandate or the resources to do that themselves, and they'll go to the outside. You can go out to the outside if you don't have anything current through consultants, perhaps, bring in someone that can temporarily provide that for you. You can start having that consultant maybe work with your internal people to start educating and training internal designers. At some point, you may want to consider bringing in your own human factors people. Maybe start with junior human factors folks that that consultant can work with on a liaison or a mentoring basis even to build it. And eventually you're going to work to the point of having an internal staff of some sort. What about facilities? I mean, how complex does it have to be? I'm thinking now about one-way mirrors and you know, Well, that that's the model that everybody always talks about is having the observation room for doing usability studies. You've got, you know, very expensive video equipment and elaborate one-way mirrors and lighting and all that kind of and I Obviously, that's, that's great, and it's good for a lot of kinds of testing that might get done. But you can learn an awful lot with a lot less than that. I, for instance, have worked 
uh, to gather uh, data about how to design a product and to do usability testing, everything from walking down a hallway and talking to somebody in their office to in the medical environment, frequently going out to hospital settings, uh, meeting with uh, nursing staff in a break room, for instance, showing them a new product. Uh, you can go out to uh, medical professional conferences and recruit people off the floor of the conference to come up to a hotel suite and, and use a new product. Um, all those are possibilities. You talked about getting a champion within the organization. I want to. I want to have other folks comment on it as well. Where does the real responsibility lie in the firm, for one thing, and does it start top down or bottom up? Do you need? You know, how much do you need upper management buy-in before you can get anywhere? Anybody want to comment on that? Well, I personally think that you have to have receptive management, and that means that management has to submit even if only to a little education in order to know what it is that they're supporting. What about, I, the, uh, go ahead. Well, one of the things, I, I absolutely agree, John, with that, that there needs to be the management commitment, but I found that at least recently, there's been a lot of working from the bottom up that as the FDA has done their job of communicating the need for human factors, a lot of the program people, the design level people, are starting to pay attention and ask what do we need to do and how do we go about doing it and pushing that up through their management so that things like budgets and schedules can be adapted to, to meet that. Mike? Well, I think that one of the keys to success when you think about companies that are going to embrace human factors for the first time is that the people doing the hands-on work, whether it be in-house people or whether it be consultants, have a have a win, have a get get a really good running start at demonstrating the effectiveness of human factors, what it can contribute in a practical way to coming up with products that are safer, but also products that are going to be more competitive in the marketplace. In other words, have a have a good first win. Yes. You know, Mark, I think all of those things are very important. And in addition, I believe that you have to uh, develop your, your quality system, your process to include human factors uh, from the get-go rather than trying to superimpose uh, another uh, component, but to build it in into the process that you're using for new product and existing product design review. Pamela, several people, I'm sorry, go ahead. You want to I'm say just going to comment on yeah. this one. In that I think that's one of the things that, that I've seen is that we've started working with companies now to take their existing design process and identify the places where human factors should go in according to the FDA's commitment to that and actually getting that incorporated and that starts pushing upward because now the the requirement is there internally as part of their procedure and they start saying now how do we how do we meet that right. what does it mean to do usability testing what does it mean to have a risk analysis done from a human factors perspective for instance I think it's very important because the the management commitment most often will be there but management may not necessarily know what it is and it may be to the other quality engineers uh, to uh, put it in place Pamela we've heard several people talk about determining user needs you know, how do you go about doing that? What are user needs from the standpoint of human factors engineering, not from the standpoint of what else they may want to have on the device? I think it's important that human factors engineering is part of the project team right from the beginning because marketing will be identifying user needs, but a lot of times those are a list of features, features that the customers have asked for, features that the competition has in their product, features that are responses to problems that have occurred in the field. Human factors engineering is going to look a little differently. They're going to be looking at the user need as a safe, safe, usable product. And they're going to derive a different set of design inputs and user requirements. They're going to do that by really looking at the end users. Who are they? What are their capabilities and limitations? What are the tasks they're going to perform using the product? And what's the use environment? So for example, let's say that this is a product that's destined for in-home use by elderly patients. Human factors engineering is going to drive a set of requirements like the fonts need to be larger, they need to be on a high contrast background, we're going to avoid colored fonts, any auditory signals are going to be in a certain frequency range and these users need to have a volume control. Different they, set of requirements. You're not necessarily starting from scratch. You may have a product that you already manufacture that's somewhat similar. You can use that maybe or somebody that somebody else makes. Right. The other thing the human factors engineering person is going to do is actually go out and study use of the existing product, similar products, concepts, prototypes you have. They're going to do things like usability testing, cognitive task analysis, and you're going to learn a lot from that. You're going to discover problems you didn't know about, but you're also going to discover opportunities to make a great product. What about, what about having marketing do this or how the clinical people do it? Is that fraught with problems or can you do that? 
Well, I think I think it's two different sets of skills, two different two different kinds of questions. Human factors engineering person is looking at it in terms of a human being with capabilities and limitations interacting with equipment. They're looking at those kinds of questions. Uh, what are the, the users doing, and what's in the use environment? And is there noise, and what is the lighting? The marketing person goes to that same environment, and they're looking at issues of what are the features, you know, what's the curb appeal, what are the messages. Well, you've we'll used to the term the, the preference trap. What do you mean the by that? Well, that they're going to be looking for kind of curb appeal and messages that the customers want to hear and they're going to look at price points. You need both to do a product, but it's complementary skills. Yeah, let, let me interrupt you. Just We've got a lot of questions now. We want even more. So keep those questions coming in. Phone them, fax them, email them, and a little later on we're going to be answering those. Anyway, um, uh, you're talking about the ability to use the device. I mean, that is important as well, right? Um, That's key. Okay. Uh, Mike, let's talk about usability testing. Uh, how do you go about setting that up? Mike, there you are. Yeah. Well, I think usability testing comes in many different flavors. And depending on how you're approaching things, you might set things up differently, whether you're using consultants um, or whether you're doing an in-house effort. But I think there are some common things about any usability test that you would set up. Principally is you've got to decide how rigorously you're going to approach testing. I liken usability testing to shampooing your hair in the sense that when you add shampoo to your hair, you're cleansing out all the, the bad stuff in your hair and uh, people who are very thorough do it twice uh, to get it extra clean. When we do usability testing, we're in essence trying to cleanse the flaws from a device and accordingly you might get most of the flaws out of the first test uh, but you want to come back later when you have a more refined design that's been improved based on the results of the first test and test again. What I recommend to most of my clients is they do it three times. One to evaluate early concepts, once to evaluate a detailed design that's still preliminary and one that's almost complete and might serve as a validation test of sorts. You can't give I know you can't give an absolute number, but what about sample size? Just roughly in most cases, how many people are you talking about when you do this? Well, that that touches off a debate among human factors people. Uh, some who believe that maybe even at this table. <laughs> uh, very very surely at this table. Um, I, I think it makes sense to run relatively small samples and do it more often. So I would typically recommend that you work with a sample size of say six, eight, ten people. Make sure they're representative users um, that will give you a fairly broad view of different experiences people might have with the product from a uh, first use experience standpoint. People, people are sometimes accustomed to doing clinical trials where it isn't six or eight or ten, it's two hundred or a thousand. And when you have that many people, if you make a few mistakes in choosing your, your sample, it's okay. But if you're dealing with eight or ten or twelve people, you really, it seems to me, can't make mistakes in terms of the kinds of people you choose. How do you, how do you choose them? Who do you want to get and how do you prevent getting people that are not representative? Well, I think you can put a lot of thought into how you choose participants in terms of their, their background experiences, the degree of training they've received, their uh, various use environments and so forth. I think you want to do a good job in coming up with a good screener. Um, but I would, I would caution about trying to be too precise about the way you get uh, participants for a test. I think the key thing is to be doing testing. And there are a lot of things you can't control. Uh, for example, if you were going to try to get people who were arguably less bright at using a device because you wanted to test the device on a range of cognitive abilities, that's really a tough thing to recruit for if you call up a hospital. Say you want the number of nurses to come by <laughs> within the next week to interact with your product. It would be very difficult to control for that kind of thing. Uh, in my experience watching hundreds of test sessions, I think these things come out if you, if you make a commitment to getting what may, might be considered a reasonable sample of people, uh, you'll learn a lot. I'd just mm -hmm. like to comment on that because from a, from a practical point of view, I think it's important that not only the manufacturers understand, but the FDA understand that you really don't have the control and latitude that you'd like to have in recruiting. When, when folks were in graduate school and doing nice controlled studies, it was easy to recruit, but in the real world, you can't do that. You're lucky if you can even get to nurses. They're busy people, and it's tough to get those people to give you even 20 minutes of time. So you take who you can get, and you learn as much as you possibly can from that. But 
you aren't always in as much control of who and how you're well, going to recruit. Well, talking as you about like. difficulty in recruiting, this might be a good time to ask about simulation as as a as a kind of. Uh, Substitute it. What do you think uh, about that? Anybody? It's a really valuable tool and, and one we use all the time. Everywhere, everything from very simple drawings that we're telling people how it will work to increasingly doing PC based simulations uh, that recreate what the thing is going to look like and sort of how it's going to work long before we can have an actual working prototype. And that's very effective. Pamela? Yeah, today with you know things like laptop computers, you can take a simulation of something out in the field and get feedback very early in the process. And that's the name of the game, is getting it in front of users and having them try it early in the process. And we were talking about numbers of users. You know, research shows with a handful of representative end users, you can find key usability problems. And even if you only have a handful, that is much better than a couple of engineers on their own trying to speculate about what real users would do. Which leads to the question of do you really want to use the engineering staff or the developmental staff as your subjects? And you probably don't. You absolutely not. I think that the difficulty with the, with the design people is that they know altogether too much about how something is supposed to work. And as a result, they can't imagine what kinds of errors people are going to make in using it. And what you need are people who uh, are skilled mischief makers, people who can imagine things that the designer would never have thought of and find out whether or not the device becomes dangerous as a result of all these inputs that were not planned. And, and, and while we're talking about things not to do, I think probably we're agreed that marketing research is not a good source of information for human factors as well because of its different it's totally unrelated not, source. An not an adequate source. Not an adequate <coughs> source. Right. You know, it's one, one, of the one things, of the source of information you should consider. Now one of the things when people do clinical trials, they'll do it on a large number of people and they say, well, you know, two percent of the population had a particular adverse event and that's written off and that's the end of it. I mean, the, it, what counts is the numbers. But in terms of human factors research, are you guys interested in, let's say you tested in 12 people and two of them couldn't use a the device, they really screwed it up. Do you want to know why they did? Do you want to go back and, and investigate that? Well, you're, you're, the, the, the issue is one of the investigation of error, and it used to be that what you did is count the number of errors, which is what you just did. But in reality, from the point of view of design, you're not interested just in reducing the frequency of errors, you're interested in reducing numbers of errors of particular kinds, particularly the ones that might injure or kill a patient. So you're very much interested in the content, the actual behavior, and not really very much in how many of them there were. Tim, let me, let me change the topic now. Let's say your device is now already on the market. You've done all this, and yet you are having problems. You're getting complaints, you're getting reports to the FDA, and so on. How do you work that into the human factors? Uh, spectrum of activities. Well, Mark, I, I think as Dr. Feigl said in the earlier comments, it's, it's really not uh, user error. What um, is important, I think, for designers to keep in mind and to remember is that um, accident prevention is an engineering problem. Human error is a given, and it's not an explanation. And we have to investigate those things in order to determine what um, in legal circles would be called the foreseeable uh, uses and foreseeable risks with the product. I think a great deal can be gained uh, from all of this that we discussed from, from the medical device reports as well as the information in, in uh, human factors testing because ideally what we want to try to do is, is to de design safe products. In order to design safe products we have to first identify potential hazards and risks, and then design them out. And the key items there are what is foreseeable and what technology is available to help us uh, design out those risks and hazards. You're talking about designing them out, but now we have a product already on the market, already being sold, already being used. Sometimes people say, well, instead of designing them out or changing designs, let's do another instruction manual or let's do another label. And sometimes you get the feeling, and maybe this is overstating it, that's kind of a band-aid. It's kind of a, uh, the easiest way out. Is that, uh, is that fair or not? Well, I, I think it's probably the cheapest way out in, in a way that exactly. most, most people frequently uh, will look at the problem. But if you're having uh, particular types of errors, I think you need to evaluate what the degree of risk is first, and then based on the degree of risk, apply the approach. That might be modifying instructions, might be um, implementing a new warning, but 
frequently those are the last choices in kind of a hierarchy of uh, risk management. I think, it, I think it should be recognized that if you're doing a really good job of usability testing, the kinds of things that will emerge later and that might require a band-aid are probably going to be caught or a large majority of them are going to be caught. I think practically speaking if you're seeing problems in the field uh, it's going to be a long period of time before a manufacturer is going to be able to address the problem with any kind of engineering design change. I mean you might be talking about years at least, right? Um, certainly not something that will be solved in a matter of weeks or a month or two. So really you're limited, limited to band-aids or you're limited to taking the product out of the hands of the users until it can be replaced. So I think it speaks again to the value of usability testing. Um, you know, it, it's a really good filter. One thing I might add there is I think there's an important need to, to track what you learn. You've got a product and field that is having problems, say, and you try and do your best to fix that, but you need to take that and move that into the next project's design history I'm file so you that said you that can because can that gets the next into that around. total product life cycle we talked right. about, getting that feedback exactly. through to the next one you design. Well, and that's taking particularly that important because in almost every complex human enterprise it is estimated that somewhere between 70 and 90 percent of the adverse outcomes and adverse events are due to human behavior of one sort or another usually called human errors and yet we spend much more engineering effort on increasing the reliability of the let's average it and say 20 percent which is the machine problem and practically none at all on the 80 percent which is due to people and even if we were to correct all of the possible failures of the machine, we'd still be left with 80% of the failures because talking, we're aiming at the wrong thing. Talking about people, there's an element in, in, the, in the culture of the hospital that may be working against us. I'd like your view on that, and that is that hospital workers, nurses, biomedical engineers take pride in working around a problem, that is, in, in overcoming it uh, in their day-to-day -day work. They consider that part of the job. And yet, what really should be done is instead of tolerating and working through, letting the manufacturer know that they're having a problem. Yeah. Uh, what, what about that? Mark, uh, you know, a lot of nurses are like Marines. You know, they're, they're taught to overcome circumstances no matter what they are. And they will jerry-rig things and make things fit that aren't really meant to fit together. I think it's real important that in this process that, that the manufacturers begin to solicit and the hospital clinical engineers and biomedical engineers uh, begin to be get, become educated and first in human factors and usability engineering and the value that it can have to manufacturers. Um, those folks inside the hospitals um, are in a particularly good position to be on um, the hospital's uh, equipment or technology assessment or buying groups and it's where it's there that I believe they can influence the, the purchase of equipment by asking simple questions like how has uh, usability engineering been performed with this product? I think that would be a tremendous help. I've, I've met with groups of nurses and doctors for many years now and I can look back a decade ago and I, I definitely had a sense of that can-do attitude coming from, from nurses, more so than doctors actually. But I would say there's a little bit of a trend I've noticed recently, it, which is that people are becoming a little bit more aware of, of good design. Um, they're seeing lots of exemplary products out there. I think they're getting more demanding. So in a focus group where you would be exploring people's vision and, and, and needs regarding a new product, you'll hear people now going as far as to say, well, if it's not working for me, forget it. I mean, get it out of my hospital. And I think that's a little bit of a sea change. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, Pamela, what, one of the things that people may say when they're new to this uh, they, is, well, can I afford it? How much is it going to cost me? Can I really afford to do this? How would you answer that? I hear that question a lot. And of course, that's going to depend. It depends on the device and the complexity, how far along it is it in the development cycle, how many different kinds of users, how many use environments. But here's what I can tell you. You're already spending the money. I would tell the manufacturer, you're already spending the money. You're spending the money potentially in finding problems late during a clinical when it's very costly to fix them. You're spending the money possibly in lost sales because the competitor has a product that the nurses like better. You're spending the money, you know, having meeting after meeting and focus group after focus group with engineers and marketing and clinicians arguing about a design feature where the question might have been better resolved using something like usability testing. Much better to spend the money up front and end up with a better product and a safer product. 
Let's start answering some of the questions that you've been sending in. And by the way, we've got a lot of good questions here. They're all in writing. They're faxes and they're uh, emails. We'd like to hear from you on the phone, too. So pick up the phone and call us. <laughs> One of the advantages of doing that is that I will give you the, the chance to ask a follow-up question. Call us and we'll answer and then I'll say, does that answer your question? And you can say, no, it doesn't, and ask it again. So we want to hear from you on the phone as well as on paper. But anyway, keep both of them coming. I've got a pile of them here, so let's begin. And uh, this one says, uh, and by the way, we, bo uh, both paddles are now back. We do have the FDA folks uh, on another set so that we can all pitch in here. It says, what types of tests are recommended for evaluating device instructions? What kind of documentation will an FDA device evaluator be expecting? Anybody on the FDA panel want to? Well, I'll try to answer that. Uh, when we're looking at um, use instructions, we're just going to look at readability. And, and unless the manufacturer actually provides some sort of a test of the results that he's actually done a mock-up on that, we, we won't know about it. OK, anyone else want to add to that? I well, think, I think it might be important okay, go ahead. that, that uh, the manufacturers uh, go through a task analysis of sorts in the, in the um, development of the product. Uh, it's frequently found that uh, a lot of folks will design the instructions after the product is built, and you want to design them as the product is evolving. And I think that's uh, where you conduct the task analysis to get the proper sequence of steps in the use. Okay. Well, there is a significant literature on the design and evaluation of instruction sets. You find it in the human factors literature and in the applied psychology literature. I don't have them at my fingertips, okay. but I could certainly provide them to you okay. when I get back. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't particularly care for it when folks dismiss the value of instructions, but I, I hear the voice of Matt Weinger uh, who said, we don't want to be instructed. We don't want to. We don't want to read this. We want to walk up to it. We want to use it intuitively. So, um, I think it's important to get instructions right, and I think they can serve a value for certain people with certain learning styles. Um, but I think the prevalent learning style, and one we'll see becoming even more prevalent, is that people want that walk-up intuitiveness. Okay. I'm not sure you can get it. A, a bread knife is almost intuitive, but I've seen people try to misuse it in cutting bread. And a hammer is almost intuitive. But the things we're talking about don't come anywhere near that. Most of them need some training, a great deal of experience, possibly an advisor while somebody is using it in the first instance, and a reference book to find out what to do in yeah. strange circumstances. Well, in an eye, it's okay. a labor of the issue. Uh, we okay, because we had a lot of them coming in. Go ahead, one more comment, and then we're going to go. Just, just that, from a practical point of view, you mentioned that the documentation may not be available until near the end. And, and that's the dilemma because whoever's writing the documentation has to have something to write against and the software is changing and all that. There is a real practical concern there. And I think in the same way the device gets user tested, there needs to be more emphasis put on user testing of that documentation as soon as it's available and on an interview basis. There is we have a I want to take a phone call and we've got a lot of questions. So let me take a phone call from Orange County, California. Orange County, you're on the air. Orange County. It's to um, a comment made earlier from one of the FDA ladies, and it was a comment to the effect of a manufacturer needing to take preventative action if misuse or off-label use is encountered on any significant level by a manufacturer. The first question would be, what regulation would require that? And the second one is, I, I wanted to focus more on off-label use. What would you expect? Uh, a manufacturer to do if they did encounter significant off-label use or what would you recommend that they do to try to rectify the situation or, or I guess make people more aware uh, of the off-label use indication? Well, two things, since I'm the only lady FDA person, I assume the question was to me. Um, 820.100, which is corrective and preventive action, requires you to analyze your data, and if it's coming in through complaints, service reports, or any type of reporting feedback mechanism, you have an obligation to try to prevent or, or, or correct that, that happenings. Also, um, 801.5, which is the labeling regulation, also has some regulatory requirements that, that talk about information that you gain. Once it comes to the attention of the manufacturer, there are certain responsibilities. Um, you can't give a one-stop answer to, to your question. It, 
depends on the significance of the problem. It depends on the root cause of the problem. Uh, like some of the gentlemen, or, or I forget who mentioned it, you know, redesign does not happen overnight. So there may be a series of steps. In other words, you may take a first step that is, quote, cre corrective and might be a Band-Aid at that point in time. But it may get you or buy you some time to feed that into a redesign or perhaps a design change that could better address the question. So so FDA's expectations, if you will, will depend on the significance of the problem and the strategy that the manufacturer lays out. That can be a short-term strategy as well as a long-term strategy in dealing with the issue. And oftentimes it may depend upon having more information come in and, and getting some more outside information as well. Caller, does that answer your question? That's great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's go to a, to a written one here. It says, doesn't grandfathering devices into the market permit poorly de designed devices to enter the market? Should all devices be evaluated individually? I guess that sounds like an FDA question. I, I will. I'll try to handle that one. Well, the way our law was written in 1976, it allowed for that grandfathering clause, and that law has not been changed since then. So what we want to do is if, if we want to move toward that, then you would need to uh, get, seek a legislative change for that. Uh, this one says, is anyone else want to add to that? <coughs> okay, this one says, since the FDA doesn't actually do human factor research and evaluation, they have to rely on the manufacturer's word. Isn't there a lot of room for the manufacturer to fudge the evaluation? It couldn't be written by a manufacturer, <laughs> surely. Anybody want to? I think that's it. Go ahead. That, that's something that's universal. The FDA doesn't test sure, doesn't I test I think, products that evaluates. No, we, we, do, we don't have a testing lab. Uh, we do do reviews, but uh, of course uh, we can only do a limited amount of that. Uh, there's, I think there's the potential for um, fudge data anywhere, whether it's uh, human factors data or any other kind of data. Uh, of course, anybody that does that is running the risk, to, risk of being caught uh, and charged with fraud, and that, at least that's my understanding. Uh, also, the people, at least in the human factors staff, uh, do have enough understanding of human factors that uh, we can usually evaluate uh, the quality uh, of the human factors content of a submission. So I, I agree that that potential exists, uh, but it's one of the challenges uh, we have to try to make sure that uh, that data is uh, good and accurate and appropriate. But I do have to add, we do have some testing capability. I mean, we have WEAC, we have our Office of Science and Technology, but that is used more on global issues as compared to individual manufacturer application type issues. They're, they're global issues maybe for a particular brand or, or group of products that, that we, we have. We have well, Kim, what I was... No, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, what, what I meant by uh, that we don't have testing capability, we don't have a human factors right. lab. Uh, not yet, anyway. Uh, where, you know, I have worked in facilities where we did have a human factors testing lab and we would bring people in and we would do testing. Uh, as yet, we don't have that. Uh, but we do do other types of testing. Okay, let's go to another phone call. Again, it's Orange County, California. You're on the air, Orange County. Yes, to some extent, the definition of good human factors design is subjective. How do we as manufacturers reconcile this subjectivity? Well, I think that's been a concern to the FDA in, in terms of, based on my assessment of things they've said in various standards meetings that I've participated in. I represent the AMI Committee, Association for the Advancement of Medical Instrumentation, and Pam does as well. Um, and we've been working on a process guide that AMI will be publishing in a relatively near term. In fact, Matt Weinger is the co-chair of that committee. And that will be a guide that tries to lay out in a process-oriented sense what it is to do good human factors. And what it is to do good, good human factors is to lay out a program of activities that will systematically help you identify user needs, translate those into product requirements, come up with good designs, and evaluate those designs. So I believe the FDA, as far as I can tell, is really committed to that kind of uh, guidance and will probably be endorsing that standard when it comes out. 
Anyone else? Yes. Yeah, I, I think that's that's a good answer. You know, there's a human factors engineering process, and do you have one in place, and are you following it? That's kind of a, a high level um, measure of good human factors. But I would also say, um, if you're talking about looking at a device and just saying, does it have good human factors? Um, as part of your design process, you should upfront define some concrete, measurable, testable usability specifications. Absolutely. In other words, you have specifications for reliability and maintainability. You should have specifications for usability. What is it that makes this system pass or fail in terms of usability? So, for example, I might write one up front that says a nurse of this type with um, this kind of experience and who's used this kind of equipment and familiar with this task um, can take it and perform these tasks with you know no errors or in a certain amount of time whatever is really critical to that product but you can define some usability specifications and make that part of the the product requirements and as you design and develop that you're going to be testing against those specifications mark you want to answer that? no that's no you, you had your hand up but it was going to say the same <laughs> my, thing my point did. exactly yeah okay yeah. anyone else yes um, just adding to that then then of course there are a bunch of things we know that represent good design. We know how far apart buttons should be so that you don't accidentally strike one versus another. We know what size font should be on a screen. We know that certain color codes are representative of certain kinds of actions. Um, and so just in terms of an inspection of a design, you can go through and you can determine whether something is ascribing to good human factors practice as described in textbooks and in very very detailed standards. You know, I just thought of something. The guy who designed my car radio should be watching this. this tell, talking about little buttons that, that you can't figure out which one is which while you're driving. That's great. Um, here's another another fact. As to the best of my knowledge, the product is not submitted along with the submission. How can the FDA evaluate human factors by reviewing directions for use, labels, and so on, and not the actual device? It's like reading an automobile user manual rather than taking a test drive. Well, yes. I, I think that defaults to me. Um, of course, we, uh, we have a memor uh, memorandum of agreement with the Office of Device Evaluation for doing reviews of what we call patient labeling, uh, which also includes user manuals. Uh, when we do that, uh, to the extent possible, uh, assuming that the device doesn't weigh uh, hundreds of pounds, uh, we try to get a sample uh, device if possible. Uh, when we don't, uh, there's typically uh, uh, pictures of the device uh, or drawings of the device in the uh, user manual that we can refer to. And after a while, a lot of it is just experience. Uh, admittedly, it's, it's not a perfect situation for doing that evaluation. And again, what we're trying to do is do, do the best we can with what we have and, and keep the process uh, moving and give feedback to the extent that we can uh, that will be helpful to making that, uh, that information more usable uh, for, for the users. And a lot of times we recommend to the manufacturer when we review that material that they do test the content of uh, the user instructions with a representative group of users to see if they can understand it and see if they have any problems with it. That's sort of a blanket recommendation we have. Occasionally we see that that's been done. Uh, we'd like to see more of that, of course. I was going to comment yeah. that if the device is actually exists in a physical state, one of the field uh, inspection team of FDA uh, if trained in human factors, could go in and do a preliminary evaluation, at least on the major aspects of how well it's designed, because there the machine exists. Uh, this, this is an interesting one. I'm not sure that I understand it, but it says, how should a manufacturer document that they considered a user need but did not address it? I imagine that means that it was considered and it was, and, and it was okay, and therefore, how do you, how do you document that? Yeah. Well, from my experience in, in conducting usability, we, we frequently get into that situation where there will be some issue that comes up. It'll be noted, it'll be discussed among the team members, and then for a variety of reasons, maybe it's not critical enough or significant enough, possibly it's too late in the design cycle to do something about it, but it is at least noted, and the remedial action that's taken, either we're going to fix it, 
we're not going to fix it for the following reasons, or we're going to defer that for a future generation of product is noted, and that becomes part of both the usability test reporting and ultimately the design history file. So right. in, in my experience, that's one way that it can be addressed. The FDA have a comment on that? Oftentimes, the inspectors can also see it um, coming out through their risk management program, through some sort of risk analysis, where they may ha acknowledge the fact that there is an issue, and they may choose to not do anything, but they can offer the fact that they may be mitigating it through other means as well. That's where we often see it is somewhere in the risk okay. management. Okay. Yes. You know, I, th I think that's a critical point. Again. I don't think you want to try to superimpose a human factors approach on a company, but integrate it into existing systems and processes, such as the, the risk analysis that is being performed by companies for a number of reasons. Human factors should be a portion of that. Okay. I have a, go ahead. I was going to say there's a lot more here I want to get to, so make the comments brief, and we'll try to do as many as we can. Yes. Well, I was just going to say something sort of opposed to the philosophy of good human factors engineering, which is <laughs> you often hear the expression that the customer is always right, and that, that tends to be applied to sales. I don't, I don't really think that's the case when it comes to human factors. I think the customer's needs need to be viewed in balance with the business objectives and the engineering feasibility of things. And good human factors engineering is finding a balance point between those, uh, but making sure that you don't make a decision and pre present a design that is, is unsafe. Uh, but when it comes to more preferential matters, um, users can tell you what they want and you may have very good reasons, rational reasons, not to go there. Yeah, well, that was you talked about that earlier about pre, about the preference trap. I mean, it, it's not always what they want is not always uh, best for safety. I think if you if you design products according to what people were telling you in the focus groups, where they're not embracing the engineering limitations and and so forth, you would get products that were caricatures of the products that they really want. You really have to apply the judgment because the users aren't designers; they're just telling you what their needs are, and you have to interpret them. Oh, here's another one. It says, for, uh, since the vast majority of devices are approved by the 510K process, which requires a predicate device and the demonstration of substantial equivalence, how would a manufacturer with novel human factors features get a device approved without going through the more costly PMA process? In this sense, the 510K process seems to, process seems to hamstring innovation. Okay, well, I'll try to take that answer. Um, what we're looking at in a 510K is really the substantial equivalence of this new product to the predicate. And we do see a lot of technological changes that occur and, uh, and that move along as, as technology and, and new things become uh, uh, to the market. So it is possible to do that. What we're looking for that pulls it into the PMA realm is where you're changing the intended use or its performance is not as good as what's already out there on the market. Uh, we have a phone call coming in now from San Jose, California. San Jose, you're on the air. Hello? Yes, San Jose, go ahead. Hi. Um, I have a question for either Pamela or John, or Ron, sorry, um, from the FDA. What is the ideal role of the human factors engineer or group in a medical device company? Go ahead. Pamela would be better for that. <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, you know what? Government? I see human factors people in different roles. There are, you may have a corporate level human factors person who is worrying about overall process and getting um, process documents out there and, and standards and, and worrying about that. Um, if somebody's really doing design, where they're really going to be working on the usability of a particular product, I believe they need to be really close to the engineers that are doing the work. They need to be an integrated part of that team and not just somebody outside who, who, who comes in and, and is seen as adding extra work. So there are many different roles. Um, you can also have human factors people, again, more at the corporate level that are doing training. They're giving courses or they're bringing in courses on user-centered design and human factors engineering. So there are, diff there are different places for them to be. But if we're talking design, I think they need to be really close to the design team. Anyone else? Yes. I, I just add to that that one of the things that, that some of my colleagues have felt was important that has to do with the placement within the organization and in particular the charging for it, that, that to be simplistic about it, human factors support, design support to a program ought to be free. 
That is, the program needs not to feel like they're going to have to pay for every bit of that. Otherwise, they won't make full use of it. That if within the corporate structuring, it can be a service kinds of facility, that often works best. Now, that may not work in every case for all organizations, but at least it's one of the things that needs to be considered. How do we pay for human factors? And, and, and that's important too early on, because if they're saying, how much is this going to cost me? You need to first demonstrate the real value of it. Exactly. And, then, and, then, and you can do that better if you're not directly charging to the project. And when I said you need to work closely with engineering, I don't necessarily think you should report to engineering. I think there are built-in conflicts and trade-offs on a product. Engineering is worried about cost and schedule. Human Factors is really looking out for safety and usability. And there will be trade-offs to make, and it's good if they're not all reporting up to the same person. Yes. You know, frankly, one of the, the uh, things that companies could do immediately is to put into their process that a member of each product development team becomes the human factors advocate for that particular device. And in a larger corporation, then the in-house human factors consultant assists each one of those product development teams um, with situations that arise. Yeah. Well, I, I tend to do agree with your point about it would be a great world if human factors was sort of this, this uh, overarching thing that, that was applied to all projects. Um, I think just from a professional standpoint, though, uh, there are a lot of other kinds of engineering professionals who might think their service to the product development effort would be equally valuable and should be overarching as well. So I think I'm, I'm a, I have mixed feelings about whether I want to sort of be a line item at a corporate level or, or whether human factors should really earn its keep by demonstrating its value just the way mechanical engineering and electrical engineering and packaging engineering and industrial design might have to. Caller, does that answer your question? God. It must. It <laughs> must have because she's gone. That was a. If you're still there, caller, that was a very good question. I think we had a lot of got a good conversation out of that. Uh, how, we've probably got just about three or four minutes before we have to close. Let me do a few more of these written ones. How would the experts here apply human factors engineering to the design of class one exempt devices like wound dressings? You know, mm -hmm. from my experience, some of, some of the most severe problems that have occurred with medical devices have been from some of the simplest um, items. Elevated toilet seats, for example. People fall and break hips all the time with those things. They're multi-million dollar uh, lawsuits. Just because the, the product is simple doesn't mean that it should not go through uh, a process. The process may be simpler, but the risks and hazards that are foreseeable have to be identified. Let me do one more uh, in the time remaining, make it a quick answer. Does the focus on human factors by the FDA suggest that the FDA may take a more proactive stance on known problems? How will the FDA publish such issues so that manufacturers know that the issue must be addressed? Um, well, I think from a device evaluation standpoint, we're going to try to get that information back through the reporting mechanisms that we have already. And if we can get that, we will try to get that back in as we review new products going on the market. Okay. One, one of the mm -hmm. other things we have for pre-market approvals, there's a manufacturing section and a part of submitting some of your design procedures. We are specifically looking for in your design input references or consideration of human factors as well as we mentioned the design validation protocols having some consideration to human factors and that's all prior to product approval. I think we're going to play it safe and end it right about there. Uh, the clock is telling us that this, uh, this program is just about wrapped up. I think we can find the best takeaway message from this whole human factors teleconference to go back and listen to something that Dr. Weinger said in that videotape we saw earlier. Let's go back and listen to it again. An effective design will incorporate users in the design process from the very beginning and will consider carefully how a device will be used in the wide range of environments that it might be used in and the different types of users. Okay, I hope that says it all, and I hope that the message that you've heard today from these folks takes hold. I also hope you enjoyed this teleconference and that you got some benefit from it. We certainly enjoyed bringing it to you. Until next time, this is Mark Barnett.